this truck in NASCAR is Earnhardt finally wins on a road course. It was Gary who the NHRA. A Kinzer doubles his pleasure. And some good news in racing that has an Oklahoma City connection. Hi everybody, I'm Pat Patterson and uh, your channel surfing stops uh, right now for the next 60 minutes. We have a full platter of racing news and highlights and you're not going to see anywhere else. So without further ado, let's start with NASCAR and the Winston Cup Series annual visit to the wine country of Sonoma, California. Part of what makes NASCAR's semi-annual visit to a road course so much fun is that you never know how many drivers are going to go off course and what sort of fun awaits them when they do. Jason Young has the story of today's Save Mart 300. In the early laps, pole sitter Ricky Rudd is the leader, but all of a sudden the tide Ford is off the pace. No, Rudd just had a slight miscue. He'll be back at it in just a moment. Mark Martin is now the leader. A round of green flag pit stops are needed a few moments later by most of the field. Then another full course yellow flies when Joe Nemechek takes a wild ride in the Burger King Chevy. The tires give him a boost. Now he needs a lift. Nemechek keeps going after help from the tow truck. At this point, Ken Schrader is out of pit stop sequence and has the lead. Once he stops for service, Martin will take the top spot. The Sears Point Raceway creates problems for a number of drivers. Kyle Petty grabs a little grass and continues. And talk about a wreck that didn't finish. Four wide through the turn 11 hairpin. They keep them straight with no harm. And from the bumper cam, we get an idea of what it takes to be a good road racer. A quick break and a stout bumper. It wasn't Rusty Wallace's day, or Dale Jarrett's for that matter. They caused the fifth yellow. Davy Jones is also involved. But you have to give a call to this course worker who almost got Jarrett back on all fours. Some of his friends join in and the Texaco car is ready to roll again. Now let's take a look at the final laps. It's leader Martin and Dale Earnhardt battling down to the wire. It looks like the Valvoline driver is going to keep it, but heading to the white flag, Martin slips just enough for the Goodrich driver to get by. From there, nothing would stop Dale Earnhardt from taking his first career road course win. Behind Earnhardt and Martin, it was Jeff Gordon, Ricky Rudd, and Terry Labonte. For Final Edition, I'm Jason Young reporting. So, by winning his first road race ever, Mr. Earnhardt has only the Daytona 500 as a significant event that he's never won. The margin covering the top three is so close that the next race uh, Memorial Weekend could shuffle everything up all over again. Marlon is still hanging tough in the top five, and Ted Musgrave's been hanging around there all season as well. Now, one other note from NASCAR this weekend, Ernie Irvin underwent a successful brain surgery in San Francisco Friday. This was not emergency surgery, rather a two-stage operation was performed to further, for, further his recovery from near fatal injuries suffered last August. Doctors termed the operation as 100% successful, that's great, and Irvin was uh, at the track Sunday afternoon. Irvin's race team spokesman says the uh, timetable for Ernie's expected return to racing may have to be altered because of the procedure. Now, one of the big stories last weekend at Talladega was outside pole sitter. Qualifying lap uh, exceptionally well was Loy Allen Jr. He's uh, back with his old TriStar Motorsports team, and he posted a career best 10th place finish. And he stopped by a few minutes ago to talk with us. You're, you're in the news in a big way. All of a sudden, you're in the news again in the same way that you have been. You sit outside pole at Talladega. You go out there and you finish 10th in a team that you're familiar with, obviously. Um, well, that has to be some kind of omen there, isn't there? Oh, it is. Uh, you know, being back with uh, TriStar and, of course, Mark Smith staying with me, uh, you know, going over to the 27 car with the engine deal. It was just almost natural to go back with that team. And, uh, you know, having a good run at Talladega for the Health Source sponsorship the first time out to NASCAR uh, was a good thing for us. I think it was an interesting story you were telling, too, about the fact that all that just kind of happened at the same time. It's funny in this business how... You know, you can spend a whole time, a lot of time looking for a deal, and then all of a sudden something just falls right out at the right time. It was. You know, of course, uh, when I left that team, I was uh, going back to try to find a Bush deal and try to get experience on the short tracks, and we're still trying to do that. But, uh, you know, Health Source coming along at that time uh, and, and going back to the TriStar, it just it all happened at the right time for us to be able to go to Talladega and start off in that way, and uh, it was very fortunate for us. You know, you've been pretty critical of yourself. You, uh, you, you had the poll for the Daytona 500. You certainly set a, a lot of good qualifying uh, laps last year and some people will say well he had the Hoosier tires or he had this or he had that nevertheless 
do you feel like the experience you've gotten over the last year and a half or so is, is starting to come together within yourself? In other words, are you pretty confident when you sit down in the race car now that at least you know you're going in the right direction? Well, I think so. You know, of course, uh, races like Talladega, where you're able to uh, get up front and run with the uh, guys uh, like that and get a lot of experience where they start drafting with you, that gives you that confidence that you need. And I think, uh, you know, over the last couple of years, uh, we've gotten more confidence to run with these guys. We just, we've got to get in these short tracks to be able to get that experience. And, uh, uh, you know, I, th I think the other day, uh, you know, at Talladega really said a lot for this team. You know, of course, the Hoosier last year really helped us out a lot, but for this team to be able to come back, uh, you know, not ever going into the wind tunnel, to go to Talladega was a big benefit for us. What do you think it'll take for you to feel like one of the boys in this deal? I think making all the races, you know, I think uh, that's something hard for any of the young drivers, any of the rookie drivers to do, and I think if you can make all these races, uh, that says a lot. Uh, you know, you've got a lot of the drivers that, uh, you know, haven't done that and a lot that have, and I think uh, that'll make the difference. You've got to get into that sport, make all the races, and then uh, hopefully get some top ten finishes, and then you kind of, you know, feel like you're starting to kind of fit in and, and you feel a little bit more stable in your sport. If you had to pull into the garage last week, take your helmet off, look in the mirror and go, Finally, I finished a race. Am I right or wrong? Uh, that's right, and especially in the top ten. Uh, you know, that was the big thing for us. We always wanted that top ten finish. You know, we finished 11th at this World 600 yeah. that's coming up uh, last year. But that top ten just, you know, really felt good for us. Uh, you deserve it. You worked awfully hard for it. Uh, you come up Charlotte now, and uh, do, I, do I understand you're going to try another race with the with TriStar guys and with the Health Source again? That's exactly. Uh, we're with Health Source. Uh, that's an this, HMO, by the way. That's right. Okay. It's uh, HMO. It's uh, Health Source Health Plans, which is native to Raleigh and native to North. Carolina so uh, you know we're looking forward to going to this race with them and hopefully we can uh, you know make the select and, and get in it from the open and uh, you know that'll be really good and give this, this whole team and me a lot of confidence. And you are still looking for perhaps a bush ride for the rest of the year? Oh that's exactly uh, we're talking to a lot of different people and uh, a lot of sponsors to try to find a bush ride uh, for me to be able to get this short track experience that I need and hopefully continue on with Health Source and TriStar and just kind of stay into Winston Cup where we can stay racing with these guys uh, which is so important man has the right attitude and he's probably got the stuff to get it done keep your eye on Loy Allen up next Eddie goes for two in a row and the Buckeye State is on pit road final edition continues stay with us in a row the American Speed Association's AC Delco Challenge Series was in the Buckeye State that's Ohio and Mike Eddy was trying to make it two in a row how'd he do Brian Drebber tells us the Glass City 300, stop number two on the AC Delco Challenge Series, got underway with Mike Miller in the Orange 18, earning his first ever pole position. But it wouldn't be long before outside pole sitter J.D. Summers in the number 22 car would pass for the lead. Summers held on to that advantage for a short amount of time, but soon it was the veteran Mike Miller back out in front, being chased by Glenn Allen Jr. in the 15 car and Mike Eddy in the Black 88 running third. This incident in the middle of the race, as leader Brian Refner got into the back of the car of Ted Smokestad, Refner was assessed a stop and go penalty for his action, and when it was all settled out, guess who is out in front? None other than the seven-time ASA champion, Mike Eddy, on his way to what would be his second victory of the season. Late in the race, however, the challenge came back from Mike Miller and also from the 48 car of Joe Knott. And in the final five laps of green flag racing, Mike Eddy able to hold on for the victory, Mike Miller finishing second, Joe Knott a career best third place finish, veteran Bob Seneker at fourth, just ahead of Rick Beebe with a great run from 28th to finish fifth. All right, thanks, Brian. The Bush Grand National North Series made its furthest foray south with a visit to the Keystone State in Pennsylvania's Jennertown Speedway was the site. Mark Allen has a story. 13 states are represented among the 44 drivers who try to make the 30-car field in the 150-lap race. Enough with the numbers already. The top eight qualifiers are inverted. Brian Ross takes the early lead from Paul Sitter, Dennis Doyle. By the 23rd lap, Robbie Crouch, a five-time winner over the series history, has his mount in the front. The big incident of the evening involves the 63 of Brandon Butler and several others, but it's mighty hard to drive off when you're aimed at the sky. In the final 50 laps, Crouch is getting good pressure from Kelly Moore in the 47 and Dale Shaw. In fact, pressure is not the right word as Shaw pulls the rare feat of going upstairs to get the lead and then extend his margin. But Moore's got a little something left, and with 17 circuits to go, he makes his move. Only problem is, Shaw's in the way, and soon after, so's the wall. Shaw's done for the night. 
Moore's sent to the rear of the field for rough driving. So that puts Crouch back in front, and he jumps all over the gift to give car owner Don Ling his first win. A full one-third of this race was run under caution. Shaw finished 22nd. This is Mark Allen reporting for On Pit Road Final Edition. Thanks, Mark. And just about the same time, about 1,100 miles south, the Arca Bondo Marhide Supercar Series, say that three times real fast, brought the curtain up on the uh, short track portion of the 1995 season down in Pensacola, Florida. It wasn't that long ago that Five Flags Speedway only had a front stretch wall. So having a barrier all the way around the track now can mean one of two things. Everybody's going to stuff it in the outside fence, or everybody's going to be extra careful. The truth, in this case, is somewhere in between. Early on, Bob Hill and Don LaDuke go for the same real estate, but that's the only contact, and you'll hear Hill's name again. In fact, how about right now? As he's part of the lead scrap coming down the home stretch, Bobby Bowser's in the 21 and leading, but the 75 of Bob Shack picks the right spot in traffic and takes the point. After a good bit of lead swapping in the final 25 laps, the front runners are in traffic again with Hill in front. He picks one way, Shack picks the other, and his decision proves to be the right one as he leads the final nine laps and wins by just under two seconds. Seconds. Looking at the top five, give a call to Brewer, who comes from 19th to finish fourth. Coming up next, some super racing action. Don't go away. Only our long feast of racing highlights. Next up on the plate is NASCAR Super Truck Series. So far, we've seen some familiar faces in the winner's circle, like Ken Schrader. But we've also had some folks carrying off the hardware whom you may not know or be all that familiar with. But Friday night in Oregon, one driver is going to become a lot better known. For the fourth straight event, Mike Skinner has the Goodwrench number three on the pole alongside his Joe Rutman and Ernie Irvin's Coca-Cola Ford. And this is a night to remember. We'll have more on that in just a moment. Toby Butler gives a sign that something is wrong. And there's the problem Stephen Portengay around for caution number one. And quickly, yellow number two flies for P.J. Jones and Wayne Jacks. Poncho Carter is also collected in the grass. It's an extended caution, though, because now it's raining. But this is a short shower and it's back to full speed with Skinner still out front, closely followed by Ron Hornaday and Rutman with just 24 laps complete. It's a rough and tumble evening for Rick Corelli in the total petroleum number six. That's Jones just ahead in the diehard Chevy. Both keep going without too much damage. At the halfway break, Skinner is still on the point. He's opening the margin on Rutman who's back up to second place. It's just not a good night for P.J. Jones. After a spin, he gets hit in the rear two times. This is caution number seven. Now, I told you earlier this was a race to remember, and this is why. Jax gets the not-so-great honor as the first person to go over in a super truck. Jax doesn't have a major sponsor. However, he does have a Las Vegas radio station on the quarter panel. He's trying to win a contest worth $10,000 for the best exposure. I'd say the radio station just found a winner. The final caution flies when points leader Hornaday tangles with Jack Sprague in turn four. With five laps to go, the green waves with Skinner the best in class all night. He leads flag to flag for the win. Second goes to Rutman, followed by Butch Miller, Butler, and Mike Bliss. I'll just keep on trucking, boys. Up next, the uh, Golden State, uh, California, was the uh, Michelin Pro Rally Series. Went flying through the woods again. Sometimes it's more important to do a little extra tweaking and double checking. When you're flying, in a figurative sense, through the mountains of Angeles National Forest, you don't want something important to break, like a tie rod. That's race leader Carl Merrill trying to keep from driving off the side of the mountain. It's better to hit the bank than go the other way. You rally fans know that Paul Schwinier and Jeff Becker are always the team to beat in their Hyundai, and ultimately they did prevail. But a little bit of luck played into the outcome. Henry Joy might have won, but lost half of his four-wheel drive with two stages to go. In the end, it was four for four for the Vermont-based winners, but the margin was a razor-thin 11 seconds, which is a photo finish in rally terms. The total course length was 115 miles. 
And when we come back, some of the not pleasant news in racing. Stick around, everybody. in the country and there are blind spots where if something goes wrong there can be some real problems that's what happened last sunday in imsa's series annual three hour race for the world sports cars and the gt1 and gt2 cars road atlanta is one of the fastest courses imsa visits each year and with three different classes running closure speeds were of concern to some competitors 18 minutes in imsa's worst crash in years brought out an immediate red flag the car cut in half, the world sports car of Fabrizio Barbaza. The other is Jeremy Dale. A pair of GTS2 cars had already crashed in front of this pair. Another look at how little time Dale had to react. Initially, Barbaza was knocked unconscious. Dale suffered severe foot and leg injuries. Both were critical until midweek. The clock on the three-hour race kept running during the 90 minutes it took to get this calamity cleared up. Once restarted with about an hour of racing left, everyone was really minding their manners until about 15 minutes left when Freddie Leanhart and GTS driver Steve Millen got together. This one didn't look nearly as bad, and Millen even climbed from his car. But he suffered a skull fracture and a broken neck vertebrae and is now wearing a protective halo for the next nine weeks. Officials said enough and checkered the race early. The world sports car winner for the first time this decade was a Ford driven by James Weaver. A pair of Ferraris gave chase for overall honors. Now, in a prepared statement, IMSA responded to the incident, which has some competitors questioning whether all three classes should have been uh, racing at Road Atlanta at the same time. Well, IMSA has already initiated a thorough review of the incidents and of our standard emergency operating procedures. Uh, when uh, that uh, review is complete, we will issue a summary of our findings and any recommendations. And IMSA says that the next event will go off as scheduled in Halifax, Nova Scotia in two weeks. Now, here's the latest on the three injured drivers. Jeremy Dale remains hospitalized in Georgia in critical but stable condition with serious injuries to his feet and legs. Bravaza came out of his coma midweek and is in stable but guarded condition. There's a little better news for Steve Millen, who was discharged from the hospital wearing the protective halo for a broken neck vertebrae. He will be in that device for at least nine weeks and we wish them all a very very speedy recovery also part of the racing car at road atlanta was the ferrari challenge and stephanie boyd has that story class b driver george robinson is on the pole and takes the lead at the green in his ferrari 348 robinson was best in class at sebring and is hoping to go all the way this time just after the start a couple of cars take a dusty detour and watch this one driver never lets up and that's the one who keeps on going on lap two, Robinson has his hands full with the 37 of Peter Sachs, the only Class A driver in the field. Sachs easily gets past the leader and starts building up a hefty advantage in his more powerful 355 machine. A road course is bound to spell trouble for some, and sometimes you end up parked in the wrong place. Or, as number 28 Tom Murphy finds out, headed in the wrong direction. But the worst incident of the day happens when number 43 Andy Velasco loses it and slams into the barrier. This is what it looks like in slow motion. Now check it out in real time. That brings out the full course yellow, but when racing resumes, Sachs picks up right where he left off, leading 15 of 16 laps for his third straight win. Robinson's second place finish is best in class. He's followed by Steve Earle, Jim Kenton, and Brian DeVries. For On Pit Road Final Edition, I'm Stephanie Boyd. Thanks, Steph. Enough asphalt for a while. Up next, we're going to the Sprint Car Wars as On Pit Road Final Edition rolls on. Central. As we pull out of the station, we're headed to America's heartland in the world of outlaws along with some club all-stars.
The first stop on our sprint car journey takes us to Nebraska in the I-80 Speedway. Danny Lasoski and Johnny Herrera lead the field for the main event. But the man on the move early is Jack Hodden shielding the Pennzoil number 22. He goes by Herrera, who's now dropped back to fourth. But the real battle is for the top spot as Mark Kinzer dives to the low side of Lasoski to put the work in number five out front on lap three. Hodenshield runs well all night and he makes it all the way up to second, but he can't catch Kinzer, but then no one else could either. There were a few minor cautions. Randy Hannigan goes for a lazy slide at the exit of turn two with a little help from Joe Gertie. Then it's Dave Blaney in the vibrant number 10 stopping on the front stretch. Repairs are made and Blaney returns to finish ninth. But up front, there's no problems for Mark Kinzer, who easily holds on for the victory on his birthday. Second was Jack Hodenshield with Lasoski, Herrera, and Joe Gurdy completing the top five. Now it's on to Knoxville, Iowa, and Kinzer is on the front row. The pole sitter is Blaney in the yellow number 10. Kinzer takes the lead at the drop of the green, but the best early battle is for the fourth spot between Herrera in the five and Sammy Swindell in the Hooters number one. Give the spot to Herrera. But up front, once again, no one can handle Mark Kinzer as he takes his second win in two days. Second goes to Blaney, followed by Lasoski, Herrera, and Andy Hillenberg. In the points after Knoxville, it's Jack Hodenshield still atop the points, but Blaney has closed the gap. Kinzer has passed Lasoski for third, while fifth is Hillenberg. Now let's move on to the Lima Land Speedway where the club all-stars were in action. Right from the start, Van Gurley Jr. takes the point with Kenny Jacobs right behind, but they have a real hard time getting this race going. When the green does stay out, it's Jacobs out front with Del Blaney second. Gurley is dropped back to third. And then the yellow flies for Todd Kane stalled on the back stretch. Back to green and Blaney is using every bit of the cushion as he tries to catch the U2 of Jacobs. He does it when he dives low in turn one. The next caution is out when Tracy Hoover crashes in turn four. The car is badly battered but the driver is okay. Back up front and Blaney is still on the point and that's right where he stays until the checkers wave. Joy Saldana is second with Jacobs, Keith Kaufman and Kelly Kinzer rounding out the top five. And finally, last night, the I-96 Speedway in Lake Odessa, Michigan, Joey Saldana took the win. Second through fifth was Frankie Kerr, Kevin Huntley, Keith Kaufman, and Dean Jacobs. Thanks, Jay, man. And after a washout last weekend, the NARC Series got one in around the raindrops. Put on your flipping helmets because somebody's going for a ride. In this case, it's sprint car first-timer David Robinson, who gets that first career flip out of the way early. Heck, he's only 18. He isn't hurt, just smarter. This race has got a strong field up front with 92 Golden State champion Tim Green on the pole with number two points man Paul McMahon to his right. It's number two that takes number one right from the green. And McMahon builds up a sizable lead early, but sometimes there can be distractions like George Graham just about goes out of the park. He'll climb out to count fingers and toes. It adds up to 100 and he's pronounced fine. McMahon is so good this night, you almost have to wonder if he wasn't chained to the track. He leads every lap, and in a bit of trivia, our videographer Grove Hill dug up, Paul McMahon's brother, Bobby, got his first Calistoga win exactly five years ago to the day. In the final rundown, Paul's win puts him in the GSC points lead after three races, with a rare non-top five finish for Brent Kading, dropping him to second. And we'll go back uh, to the dirt a bit later in the show, but coming up right after this, an NHRA event with no rain. Honest. Good around. Pit Road Final Edition, if you're a first-time visitor, we're happy you're aboard. In recent events, some uh, clever folks have called NHRA events the Umbrella Nationals. Rain had altered uh, three straight events heading into Memphis this weekend, but guess what? It was bone dry at the Mid-South Nationals. Let's see, it didn't rain, so many of the top stars didn't seem to know what to do, except lose early. None of the usual suspects are around for the finals in Pro Stock, where Mark Powick stages against Jerry Ekman. This is the Summit-sponsored driver's day with a whole shot and best ET for his first win in over two years. We struggled a little bit the last couple years, and uh, we got this team coming back together, and for Summit Racing and Oldsmobile, especially our last year being with Oldsmobile, it's great to win a race. Now, listen carefully. In Funny Car is Gary Clapshaw, 
and Gary Densham. Unless you're a real hardcore NHRA fan, you can be forgiven for not knowing the stars in the most obscure final in memory. Clapshaw's unsponsored and in his first final ever. Densham's been there before without carrying off the trophy. It's a good race, but all Clapshaw for a slightly shell-shocked winner. Just kind of in shock right now. Uh, you know, it's hard to believe, really. A uh, person works so hard. The guys just do such a job, you know, and uh, once in a while you have a little luck. And, uh, it's unbelievable. We're just thrilled. There was some normalcy in top fuel where Corey McClendon staged against number four, Mike Dunn. Both having won this year, this looks to be the best matchup. But the Big Mac attack run of 481 at 307 miles per hour is way too much all the way down the quarter mile. Now, one of the drawing cards around NASCAR tracks are celebrity races involving Winston Cup crew members. The drivers often can't participate because of scheduling conflicts, but crewmen never met a race car they didn't like, and that was the case at Talladega Short Track last Saturday. Before we get to the celebrity drivers, let's check out the regular classic racers. This is lap one, and already the fireworks are exploding, with the yellow number three of Brent Fan getting the worst of it. He walks away okay. Pole sitter Joe Nicely in the number 14 is the guy to beat in this one. He's got the hang of these full-size V8s, while several other drivers spend the night spinning like tops. That may not be the object, but you gotta give these three guys credit for their beautifully synchronized moves. I'd call that a perfect score. Things are less than perfect for Nicely when he spins in turn four while leading. Then it gets even worse when he spins again trying to pick his way back up front. But in the end, he nicely pulls off the save as he gets past the 93 of Jimmy Victory and goes on to claim the checkers. Third through fifth goes to Dan Dickey, Chuck Brady, and Andy Dan. The celebrity race features six Winston Cup crew members, and pole sitter Danny Lawrence from Dale Earnhardt's team starts to pull ahead at the green. But as they head into the first turn, Texaco crewman Joey Knuckles takes the inside line, and as they head down the back stretch, he steals the lead away, driving the number 14. But not to be outdone, Richard Bostick from Greg Sachs' team soon comes along in the 15 machine. And as they head down the front stretch, he hands Knuckles some of his own medicine. So it's only natural that Knuckles tries to repay the favor as he challenges Bostick on the final lap. But instead, the 14 goes spinning and comes to a stop on the berm while Bostick goes on to take the win. Greg Sachs crew chief Jeff Hammond is second, while Jeff Gordon crew chief Ray Everham finishes third. Knuckles drops to fifth behind Steve Grissom crewman Brad Parrott, and Lawrence winds up sixth after falling out early. And after these important commercial messages, we'll have a dash of dash. Don't adjust your hearing aid. It'll all make sense when we come back. Things that you never see uh, as we produce this show is the great Easter egg hunt that goes on every Sunday. It seems there's always one race highlight tape that gets lost by the airline or somebody's dog eats it or something like that. Well, last Sunday, the casualty was the NASCAR Goodies Dash race in South Carolina, but our super sleuths got their hands on the tape and uh, shot the guilty party, I might add, and it was worth the wait? Well, you decide. Pole sitter David Hutto leads from the green flag after setting a new track record in qualifying. The 17-year-old looks like the driver to beat during the first 20 laps until Will Hobgood in the 65 machine moves to the front from his fourth place starting spot and gets by Hutto for the lead. A little later and here comes Danny Bagwell in the number 10. He's going for the number two spot and it doesn't take him long as Hutto drops one more position. After that, series points leader Robert Huffman is back in the picture. He started second and comes back to challenge Bagwell for the spot, going three wide with lap traffic in the process. Hutto tries to jump on that train, but has his hands full and just manages to hang on. Second place points man Larry Cottle won the season opener at Daytona, but he spins out of this one and winds up 12th. In the final laps, Huffman and Bagwell are both running strong, but neither has enough for the defending series champ as Hobgood goes on to take his first win of the season. My brother said a prayer for this race and asked the good Lord to shine down on us. He did. I want to thank Win Oil Company for giving us this ride. They have great company for us. My crew, you can't say enough about them. 
And that power plant in this thing made by, I mean, built by Clyde and Ruth and Steve and PK, Precision Engine Service, has done a wonderful job tonight. Huffman gets second ahead of Bagwell. Dave Stacy and Mickey York round out the top five. And Robert Huffman joins us right now in the studio. And, uh, you know, I don't think people have any clue how competitive that series is. But I can personally tell you from not making the show in Myrtle Beach and being three-tenths off, it's, it's just phenomenal how, how good a drivers are, are participating. Yeah, I tell you, you know, the series has really got a lot better since 1990 when uh, the last time I really competed all year. And, uh, you know, then they didn't have but probably four or five real competitive cars. Mm -hmm. And now they've probably got 10 or 12 cars that could win on any given night. Yeah, and are you surprised at, at, at the level that a lot of guys that were maybe running with you in 1990 have stepped up to in terms of the equipment they've got, the, the way they're going about running the races, and the way they're coming prepared to, to really race hard? Oh, yeah. You know, I think since uh, Goodies came on and picked up the series, and Wayne Alton had a big uh, hand in getting the series stepped up, and, you know, there's a lot of competitors that's in it that's updated their equipment and you know that they've uh, brought on some TV shows that's really made it good for the deal. Yeah, Husqvarna has gotten involved with the deal and uh, and that's helped a lot with uh, with getting the television package put together and so forth. You're leading the points and and you're facing some some old veterans who uh, uh, can can flat get it done out there. You've also got the Linden Amix out there that uh, have got the equipment and certainly a, from a youthful side of it have got the young talent. Uh, are you comfortable with this bunch and do you feel like you can beat them before the year's out for the championship? Well, I won't really say, you know, that I can beat them, but I, I feel real comfortable racing with, with that group of people. I've raced with them uh, time and time in the past couple of years, and, you know, uh, there, there's different guys out there that's going to win different races. Lyndon Amick and David Hutto, you know, all those guys, are, they're going to win a race before the season's out, but, you know, you have to pay your dues just like everybody else does. It, everywhere I go, I keep getting more and more impressed with how families are involved in, in auto racing, whether it's the SCCA or it's IMSA or it's NASCAR or whatever it is. It's, it seems like families are involved. Your dad's very involved with your race team. And, and, and is that important to you to have the family involved? And is it something that you really enjoy? Well, you know, it's a, it plays a big part in my racing career. If uh, my dad and my family was not involved in it with our uh, own personal business, it's no way that I could be racing. Do you see that a lot in the Dash Series where everybody's family does get involved with it? Yeah, and you know, I think that's what makes the Dash Series so unique. Uh, all the people that work, most of the teams don't have full-time employees. They do it all at night and everybody has their own jobs from 9 to 5 or whatever and come in and work from 6 to 11 or 12 at night on race cars. And I think that's what makes the series a much more family-oriented series. How important is it, do you feel, for you to have a career in, in auto racing? I mean, could you be satisfied with just doing the Dash Series, or do you really want to see yourself move into a, another professional touring series like Bush or like Winston Cup? Well, you know, my goal in racing is to eventually run Winston Cup, and I'm not going to be satisfied running the Dash Series. That's the reason in 90 I ran it that year, you know, and I set my goals to win the championship and win Rookie of the Year. And we done that, and I tried to move on to the Bush, and just didn't really have the funds and the backing to do it mm -hmm. like we should. And, you know, I got a lot of good people to come back and help us this year with Baldwin Enterprises there in Claremont and my dad's company, s and Pools and mm -hmm. Sig's Tire Centers and uh, Harry's Seafood Bar and Grill out of Jacksonville, Florida. And, you know, we just put, it, put together a real good package. We built our own car and, mm -hmm. you know, in 90 I drove for another guy and he's doing our motors now, John Page. So, you know, we have a really good setup to, that's got good potential to win the championship. Appreciate you coming and spending some time with us. Next race for you guys is where? Uh, Caraway down in Ashboro. We're running next Saturday night. My hometown, as a matter of fact. I hope everybody gets out there to see that. Thanks for coming out and spending some Thanks time with us. Thanks All right, and uh, we're happy to introduce a new semi-regular feature here on our show. It's called the Finish Line Racing School Tip of the Week. Every other week uh, or whenever we can stick it in there, we'll show you uh, some uh, racers and some keys to being a better driver for you non-driver types, and we think you'll uh, find it an interesting way to see how many secrets there are to going fast. Our expert in these matters is Mike Closure, co-owner of the Finish Line Racing School. Remember, racers, sometimes when you get to the racetrack to find out whether you're getting beat or not, you have to check the competition. If you clock them down the straightaways and they're beating you, you need to work on your motor. If you're getting beat through the corners, you need to work on the chassis of your race car. Remember, a smooth race car is a fast race car. 
I think you'll enjoy those as we do them throughout the rest of the year. As we head to break, here's the number where you can reach the Finish Line Racing School for more information about driving a race car for fun or profit. Stick around, we'll be right back. Since the SCCA Trans Am Series last ran a race, uh, of course, the March rainout at Sears Point didn't help matters anyway. But as we see in our Rainex Trans Am report, there was no stopping them at Phoenix Saturday night. And obviously, we don't have that piece of tape, so we'll see if we can find it and get back to you. And someone with a strong Trans Am connection is uh, in the news this weekend. The 1991 Series champion Jack Baldwin is going NASCAR Grand National Racing. Jack confirmed to On Pit Road that he'll run five to seven races this year out of Jimmy Spencer's new bush shop with Royal Oak Charcoal as the sponsor. Plans call for a full campaign in 1996. His debut will be at Charlotte at the end of the month, and I know he's excited. Remember, you heard it here first. And by the way, Jack will also be a guest on Final Edition in two weeks. We'll try to find that tape wherever it went to. And it's a great Easter egg hunt, remember? I told you about that. The uh, Formula Ford 2000 season also kicked off in Phoenix this weekend, and some Shelby expatriates figured prominently in the outcome. The first 32-lap segment is run on Friday, and right off the green, a good bit of the field has to have its head screwed on straight as Tim Dewitt goes for a sale that puts him out of the race. Happily, this doesn't happen to anyone else. After the biggest field settles down in the Formula 2000 Series history, there's a good battle up front between Jared Lozano and Lance Norick. On the white flag lap, Norick, who started seventh, finds a way by and goes on to take the win. This is dramatic and touching because Norick is the son of the mayor of Oklahoma City. So dad gets a trophy and the series instituted a season-long disaster relief fund for victims of the nation's worst bombing. After several post-race penalties for passing under the yellow, here's the official top five finish for Friday. Then Saturday, another 32 laps in former Dodge Shelby Pro drivers Mamo Gidley and Jimmy Chianis finish first and second. Chianis is the early points leader in the 2000 season. By the way, my Colorado buddy, Price Cobb, won the race. Congratulations go out to Price. Uh, that was, of course, the Trans Am race. There was some other racing action last Sunday we didn't get to uh, tell you about. Here's Neil Kassenbaum. A pill draw means the top six are inverted. That puts series champ Dale Shaw on the pole, and he sets the pace for the first half of the event. The race is pretty much clean through the opening circuits, although Tom Bowles does get turned around before mid-race, no caution. Folks expecting to see Ed Kennedy in the double zero car get instead Mike Stefanik, who worked out a deal for the ride after engine trouble in practice. He'll finish sixth. On lap 78, Dave Dion drives his Ford past the leader for the first change. The number 29 driver has been fast qualifier, so this is no surprise. But the tables are immediately turned as a Dennis Doyle and Jeff Berry incident shuffles the order yet again. Martin Truex and Doyle bring out another yellow, and that puts everybody in position for a wild three quarters of a lap. Gigi Gravel blows a motor, and Shaw ducks underneath to retake the lead. But by the time he gets to three, everything is all jumbled up, and the 71 car of Bobby Dragon squirts into the lead while Shaw ends up finishing ninth. In the final three-lap dash, Dragon has just enough for his first win of the year. You know, in the early going, I was, I was, my car loosened up a bunch, and I was, I was hanging on to Dave and Dale, but that was about it. I really didn't have anything for them. But as, as the, the laps wound down, I knew I had a good car on restarts. The car was better on cooler tires. And uh, as the laps wound down, uh, I was able to put the pressure back on them a little bit. But, uh, you know, at the end there, uh, everybody kind of picked a lane, hoping it was going to move when we got into that lap traffic. And I was lucky enough to find my way through it first. That was it. Robbie Crouch took third and Keith Lamell fourth. Mike Olson was fifth. Over in New York State, 25 drivers lined up for the season opening International Supermodified Association race. Pat Abold in the 05 jumped to the lead over Cliff Graves, who had new car blues all day and never contended. For most of the first 30 laps, it's Abold with 94 race winner Bentley Warren within striking distance. Around the 30th lap, Mike Ordway gets around teammate Warren, but he knows it won't be an easy pass to get the lead. However, it turns out Abold has a tire going down, and in turn four, Ordway claws his way to the point and never looks back. In the final rundown, Doug Dodaro gets second over Warren, Stutzman and Muldoon get fourth and fifth, Abold falls to eighth. This is Neil Kassebaum reporting for Final Edition.
Now, don't change that channel, because if you do, well, you're just probably going to miss the best part. Stick around. Last weekend, the Western State Super Modifieds ventured down into California, and it was just one of those nights. The start's okay, with Art Cervantes and Randy Power giving El Cajon Speedway fans a first-rate taste of what Western State's Super Modified racing is all about. Everyone is doing a real nice job of staying out of each other's way. Then fans see the other side of the series. First, Cervantes breaks for a caution at lap 17. It's going to get real ugly now, trust me. Rebel Jackson Jr. gets into Bauer on the restart, and before it's all over, a couple of other victims are collected. Next up, Jackson eats some wall all by himself. They try a restart. That doesn't work at all. They try it again, and you'd think they'd have it figured out by now. Nah. Seen enough? After this incident, the checkered flag flew 18 laps early, and the winner was Troy Roger for the first time. Bauer still got second despite a couple of 360s. Brian Roop is fourth and Jackson fifth. Bauer and Jackson share the points lead after two races, and one can hardly wait to see what thrills await us in the next Western States Super Modified show. <laughs> Some of this stuff's just funny, right? And finally, after a rain out last California or in California last weekend, the SCRA cranked up the motors for another feature Saturday night. Here's the best race of the weekend, unless you're a Dale Earnhardt fan. You've got your mud, lots of mud. You've got your flips. That's JJ Yaley going wrong end up for the second straight event and missing the feature. You've got the best wheel slamming going on lap for lap in any open wheel race we've seen this year. Not that everyone keeps it aimed in the right direction. Among those in this mess are Corey Cruzman in the 45 and Rip Williams in the one, who actually pulls away without assistance, but is missing full inflation on the right rear. You've got 700 horsepower ping pong going on through the pack, and there's even a time or two that no one touched each other. You've got good drivers bouncing off the fence. You've got the same driver charging to the front over Cruzman, who obviously isn't hurting too badly from that earlier wrestling match. Ron Schumann's in the 27 and pulls off to the feature win, then delivers something of a lecture. I was just talking to Corey and Ricky Gray earlier tonight and told them if I could teach them kids anything, it'd be to have respect for somebody else's race car, and I feel like I got more respect than anybody, and that's why I didn't hit him and run into him and spin him out. It'd been an easy win, and, you know, but hell, half the time, you, you know, you take yourself out, and, it, you know, it sounds like I'm blowing smoke, but that's my theory. Well, unfortunately, the yellows, I think, uh, didn't work to our advantage there. I think we had a pretty good lead at one time, and, uh, you know, the yellows kind of ate that up, and, you know, Schumann's uh, a little bit smarter than I am. He, he makes the race car work. He's got a lot of finesse, and all I can say is I got beat by the best. So, you know, I learned some stuff, and, you know, hopefully we'll make it work next time. Rip Williams gets up to third with hostling fourth, and flipper Troy Newsom rallies to fifth. What Mark say? Missing full inflation? <laughs> I think that's probably what's wrong with my racing career. Okay, go ahead and reach for the remote, but before you hit the surf button, just a reminder that uh, we'll be back next week, same time, same channel, and you can get the latest news during the week with our On Pit Road preview show. Until then, I'm Pat Patterson. Have a great week, everybody.